Hello and welcome to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Lovely to uh, to have you back with us again and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you as well to uh, the, all of those of you who have uh, so generously donated tonight. Um, and welcome to the next in our series of our Drawn to Nature events. So for those of you who haven't joined one of these uh, Drawn to Nature events before, it's a, it's a new type of event. These, these aren't art lessons. These are, uh, you know, we're not going to teach you art. These are more sessions which uh, I hope to bring you some of the... Uh, inspiration and creativity and well-being that uh, that we find here at the museum from the natural world and to introduce you to some of our specimens to allow you to find some of that creativity think of it as a bit of a sort of i don't know uh, a wander around behind the scenes with a with a friendly curator and uh, the chance to ask him any question you want and uh, maybe with drawing pad in hand be allowed to just sit and sketch things so the format tonight Really, um, we're going to start off with a 20 minute talk just introducing tonight's subject, Amber and its inclusions from our expert. And then we're going to set you several drawing challenges. And our expert has picked several specimens from behind the scenes in the collections that he researches. And uh, we're going to start with two two minute speed sketching challenges. Now, these are two specimens just for two minutes each. And um, it's really just a sort of get your creative juices going, let your line sort of find its form and wander around the page. After that, we'll move on to a six minute challenge, followed by a 10 minute challenge, which will give you a bit more of a chance to get your teeth into the subject. Finally, we'll end up with a 15 minute study of a specimen where you can really focus in and really do a, do a nice piece. And it's during that part of the session that um, I'm gonna put your questions to our, uh, our expert tonight. So do type those questions into the sidebar, click the circle, mark them as a question, and I will uh, I'll put them to tonight's speaker. Obviously, we love to see your, your drawings and your artwork, and we've seen some fantastic things over the last three sessions. So if you'd like to share your art, do um, post it on Twitter and tag us in uh, at more than a dodo. That's all one word, at more than a dodo, because we absolutely love seeing them. It's fantastic. So before we start the art, obviously it's time to introduce our expert tonight. And our expert tonight is a wonderful member of staff here at the museum, and it's uh, Dr. Ricardo Perez de la Fuente. Now, Ricardo is a paleobiologist um, and, and entomologist, and he's lectured on paleobiology, he's lectured on insects, he's lectured on paleontology. Um, he's also been on all sorts of excursions and expeditions to find his subject, uh, amber, and digging amber out of film sites, which we're going to hear a bit more about tonight. Now, Ricardo got his MA and MSc and PhD at the University of Barcelona before he moved on to uh, the University of Harvard's Museum of Comparative Anatomy, where he did a lot of work on digitizing one of the best fossil insect collections in the world. Today, we are incredibly lucky to have him working here with us at the Museum of Natural History in Oxford. So it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Ricardo Perez de la Fuente. Hello, Ricardo, how are you doing? Hello, how's it going? I'm really thrilled to be here tonight. Thanks so much, Chris, for the introduction. That was beautiful. And uh, hello, everyone. And here we are. Uh, um, so tonight's goal uh, is twofold. First of all, uh, I will I would like that we have a real fun together. We have a very good time. We have a relaxing time. But also, uh, from the personal perspective, uh, and most importantly, I don't want you to feel like this a specimen over here. I don't want you to feel trapped, almost bored to death. So we'll see if I'm able to to follow such a challenge. It's a personal challenge for myself. So Amber, um, OK, so in, how did this 100-million-year-old uh, wasp um, get fossilized uh, in this Amber piece. Uh, let's let's um, focus on, on on this question over here. Now, amber is fossilized resin. Uh, that means that its uh, plants produced uh, this resin uh, normally to seal wounds or to protect from uh, herbivores, insects, or also to protect from desiccation. Right? Only a few plant types though produce resin in high quantities and and those are the ones that in the past created uh, the amber uh, deposits right so in this particular case we have a, a forest of pine trees and all those um, secretions those productions of resin are exposed more or less 
and therefore the insects and other small uh, creatures get trapped in the resin once it gets hardened. In this case, we have here a little wasp having been stuck in a, in a resin um, stalactite-like um, emission. So once all these uh, resin pieces uh, fall to the forest floor, they can um, spend a, a while being um, uh, there until things like, for instance, um, runoff waters and, and floods gather all those uh, resin pieces that have been accumulating in the forest floor and bring them downstream. And it's when in, in areas like this, uh, at the end of the rivers, for instance, when, when the energy of the water decreases, that those pieces have the chance to deposit. Now, if the, that deposition, that burial, first of all, first a deposition and then a burial, if it's fast enough, uh, that provides the perfect opportunity for, for dressing to start the process of facilitation. Since resting, because uh, once the resin uh, pieces are um, buried with high pressure, pressure and high temperature, and a few million years passing, they start losing volatile compounds and they transform into amber. It's a very slow process, but um, one that uh, it happens with uh, in geological in geological time, a few million years, perhaps two, three million years. Of course, we all know uh, uh, about amber thanks to this movie. Um, pretty much changed um, uh, many lives of youngsters back in the day. Jurassic Park, right? Uh, in this movie, they extracted DNA from a mosquito that they used to clone dinosaurs, right? Now, interesting the, of the fact that uh, this is not possible, at least right now, to extract DNA from from uh, a mosquito or uh, another insect. But the movie was actually based on real science that had claimed to extract DNA from a mosquito. Later, uh, it was seen that uh, it was obvious that there had been contaminations on, on of the DNA, DNA from the samples. But the movie itself actually, or actually I would say uh, the novel first was based on, on real science. Now, the closest, the oldest stuff that we can recover DNA from are uh, things like mammoths uh, preserved in, in ice. But perhaps somehow in the future, this will, will become an, um, a reality. All right, but be, way before the fascination that we all had with Jurassic Park and Amber, uh, humanity has been fascinated by, uh, by it. Uh, since the uh, Paleolithic, since prehistoric times. Here in the images, Im images I'm showing um, some ornaments from the Bronze Age in from settlements in Iberia, and also a beautiful uh, Roman mask of Dionysus, Dionysus uh, from the first century. Of course, we are all fascinated by, by amber thanks to its beautiful glow and also uh, things like a, a very lovely smell and a very warm touch. From the scientific point of view, though, amber provides an amazing detail of preservation, and that's, that's why uh, it's so important for paleontological studies, those that try to understand uh, how was life in the past. Here, there's a beautiful a lace wing larva and a lace wing baby preserved in Baltic amber, which is about 40 million years old. And this is actually the type of amber that we will be seeing today. Um, so yeah, of course, amber preserves tiny details that I'm sure you all are very excited to, to draw. But what makes um, the amber record uh, really amazing is the fact that the resin had the ability to preserve uh, life almost instantly. So amber uh, provides snapshots of, of life in the past. Here in the examples, uh, we're showcasing swarms of, of uh, ants, I believe, and also we can find preserved in amber uh, mating uh, between insects or uh, relationships of um, 
symbiotic relationships. Uh, so two organisms interacting and living together. We have down at the left an example of a parasitic uh, parasite of a mite that was parasitizing this fly or nematodes, little worm-like creatures that were actually leaving the host. They were escaping the boat uh, because, of course, the insect was dying because of, of asphyxiation of, of, uh, that entails being entombed in resin, right? So we see all those instances of life in action preserved in amber. And amber preserves all sorts of uh, creatures and parts of them if the animals or organisms were much larger, right? And uh, normally we're talking about very small creatures, normally arthropods, insects, and spiders, because they were small enough and and they were not able to escape the sticky trap that resin was in the past. Amber comes in all colors, though. We are used to this orangey color, but actually we can have other tones. Interestingly, they can get closer to cream-like colors, even white, due to micro bubbles being preserved inside the samples. But amber can also be red or even crazy colors like green or blue or violet, like in this example over here. And these weird colors are due to fluorescent compounds and that were originally present in the resin and they suffered some transformation or fossilization. So actually this blue violet amber here, uh, it's a very good excuse to showcase how we gather amber in the field because that sample is uh, among the ones that I studied for my PhD and that we gathered in Spain. So here's how an amber uh, outcrop looks like. It's nothing uh, fancy and normally we tend to think about uh, outcrops being lost you know, among the uh, tropical forest uh, or the desert, right? Some of them are like that, but not all of them. And here we gather amber using regular tools like shovels and hammers. And things get really actually really fun uh, if you know if it has been raining in Spain that doesn't happen very often actually uh, unlike here in the UK so uh, it's, 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 it's a very fun experience and we extract all sorts of morphologies of amber of sizes and shapes uh, here in the examples some um, lovely amber pieces uh, that are very small some others are like stalactite shaped, are larger, or others are flattened and preserved scars, uh, allegedly from the uh, tree that secreted the, the rest in the first place. Some other uh, amber pieces can be massive in size. And we think that those, uh, the resin was produced in, uh, in the roots of the trees. Going back though to the to how we extract amber in the field, aside from using tools, we use a technique that doesn't seem very conventional, but it's really useful. We use concrete mixers to once, uh, so once these concrete mixers are charged with the sediment that has the amber, we charge them with water. And it turns out that the amber floats in, in water. So we only need to uh, leave it uh, for a while and then all the amber gets to the surface of the water and we can separate it using sieves. Here in this example we can, you can see the little uh, bits of amber. Every single bit counts. All of them can actually have insects and who knows perhaps the, the next uh, um, really important discovery in our field, right? So every single bit is, is important. But once we recover amber from the field, it starts a very a time consuming process in the laboratory, looking for uh, inclusions, so fossils inside the amber, polishing the amber pieces, and also encasing the amber beads inside artificial resin so that they are protected for the, for the future. Now, once we have the specimens and that are um, ready to be studied, we can actually study them using very novel techniques. For instance, uh, microtomography that allows us to uh, observe every single part of the specimen, no matter how it's preserved. It also allows us to make virtual cuts, sometimes to see what's inside. And this is really amazing, right, um, uh, for uh, paleontology. But interestingly, classics 
never go out of style. We are still using methods that were invented probably more than 200 uh, years ago. So this device over here, the camera lucida, it's basically a tube with a mirror in the end. So with one ocular of the microscope, so we have two oculars for the microscope, with one of them, we see the area that is being reflected by the mirror. And with the other eye, with the other ocular of the microscope, we see the sample. So our lovely brain uh, handles and creates a mixed image of the two. So we can actually trace the sample, the fossil in this case, as we are looking at it under the scope. And of course, and that allows us to create scientific drawings. Um, so for instance, in this specimen over here, it's a beautiful uh, spider with huge eyes from, from Spanish amber. And first we take drawings using camera lucida. Uh, here I took three different uh, drawings from different parts of the spider uh, from, from, an, uh, from an A4. And here's uh, the third part of the spider. And then we can combine it together. Uh, so we ink the, the drawings and then we combine everything together. And we have our scientific illustration showing every single detail or at least as much as we can gather from, from our samples. So this is the closest, uh, I guess, we get to art or to uh, express uh, our art through drawing in our uh, work, which is it's definitely something that I really enjoy. So some other examples here. Uh, so this is a beautiful uh, snake fly from Spanish amber as well. And this is a drawing of the specimen. This is among my favorite uh, specimens ever. I find it very delicate and fragile. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is another one, which is uh, more like a hairy guy. Uh, but I, I definitely something that I enjoy is uh, sometimes it's a bit obsessive, actually, uh, drawing every single uh, hair-like uh, structure or CT, as we call them in insects, that I, that I see in the um, in the sample. So I, I very much enjoy this artistic side of our work. Sometimes we can actually incorporate some more stuff into our drawings here. For instance, after having scanned it, scanned it we can add the details of the, of the eyes or the compound eyes of the insects. Or sometimes when, when things are really complex, we can add some color in order to um, help us uh, distinguish between different areas of, that are important for our fossils. For instance, here we have and a lacewing larva, an immature, and here is the drawing with uh, several colors. And each uh, the different parts of the insect, and particularly some tube-like structures that they have on their backs, they are colored in, in, in different ways. And that helps us as well. Another way we actually, um, or yeah, another way we interact with art in our, uh, in our work in, in studying fossil insects is through scientific artists and this is an, an example this is a fly that has uh, like a tube like um, mouth parts and this specimen this fly uh, used those to suck um, nectar like fluids and uh, so to feed on fluids and uh, based on this specimen we work with uh, scientific illustrators uh, often and to create these reconstructions. So it's it's a, it's a very challenging and, and rewarding process. Here, for instance, the coloration though uh, is based on extant, so in on modern uh, relatives of this fly. Uh, so color is still like one of the limits of amber preservation because, as we will see later, kind of masks the real colors. And here's the same fly uh, after having been contextualized on its, uh, in its ecosystem. We think that this fly uh, was um, pollinating uh, flower-like structures. So um, and this the kind of this flower-like structure that you see in the image is uh, um, about to be f um, um, fed on from this uh, fly. All right, so uh, uh, it's important though to refresh some concepts because tonight we'll be drawing um, some lovely insects and one spider as well. So here we are, crash course on entomology. So here we have an insect and insects have the body divided in three parts. So the first one is the head and in the head we find the compound eyes 
and uh, appendages such as the antenna that are used to sense and kind of smell um, as well, and um, things like the mandibles and other mouth parts of the insect. Second body part or region is the thorax. In the thorax, we find normally two pairs of wings, the fore wings and the hind wings, and also three pairs of legs. And lastly, we have the abdomen, and this can uh, bear different appendages for different uses, for instance, to place the eggs in particular places. And we are also be going to be um, drawing one spider specimen tonight, so I thought we would be refreshing uh, and spider anatomy a little bit as well. So spiders have the body uh, segmented or um, divided in two parts. Uh, one that we call the prosoma, uh, in which we find the carapace, the eyes of the spider, uh, and then uh, the appendages that are the first ones in this part are the chelicera, some, something that we normally call the fangs of the spider, right? Actually, spiders from the in the scientific using scientific terminology, they do possess fangs as well. But the fang, we only refer to to the kind of nail-like structure at the end of the chelicera. These uh, uh, appendages that are used to uh, inject venom, for instance. Then we have the pulps that are uh, like little legs in males. They are swollen because they are the uh, organs that transfer um, uh, um, sperm for in order to uh, for for mating. And we have four pairs of legs here. In this image, those are cut, but there's one um, drawing of a leg at the right part of the screen. Uh, in spiders have different type of leg than insects with some extra segments here, but that's not really important. Um, and then we have the abdomen or the pistosoma. Or pistos means rear in Greek. And uh, it contains um, appendages such as the spinnerets that are used to spin silk. All right. Tonight's palette is going to be relatively limited, but it's a beautiful one nonetheless. And it's uh, all about uh, the differences in light uh, that are different parts of the sample get, right? So get these colors at hand in case you are using them. And before finishing, I would like to just thank everyone involved uh, and that had that makes my research possible, something that we and I myself uh, pretty much, I really appreciate. And all right, tonight's models. Uh, this is one of the important uh, parts of tonight. And tonight we'll see five specimens. Four of them are insects. The first one is an immature one, it's a nymph. And we'll see three adult insects and also one spider, all of them they come from uh, the Baltic region. They are, it, they are insects preserved in Baltic amber, which is about 40 million years old. And this amber is gathered in the southern margin of the Baltic Sea in Northern Europe. So if now I can show you uh, this amber piece over here that contains one of the specimens that uh, we used um, for tonight. So thank you. So here's the specimen. And I can actually, using this setup, I cannot show you closely. So tonight, actually, we are um, be showcasing the specimens that have been pre-recorded. And this is actually for a very good reason, because it it's quite impossible to uh, get them all together under the scope, uh, properly lit and focused in a in a timely uh, manner. So uh, we wanted to ensure that we were going to give you the best um, quality of image possible. So that's why uh, earlier we did these pre-recordings and we'll be showcasing them uh, shortly. And some something else to take into account for, for tonight is that uh, three of the specimens, the three first ones, will be seen in a dorsal view. That means from the back. The fourth one, which is an ant, will be a lateral view. And the last one, which is a caddisfly, will be seen 
in ventral view, which promises from this side, almost looking at its belly. Now, this is important because we had the extra layer of fossils requiring interpretation, right? Uh, so um, please keep that in mind. And one last detail on that front is that the head of the specimen, so that you uh, know more or less how to interpret them, will also be placed at the top of the image or at the right. Uh, so you can actually start um, drawing from there, or at least interpreting where the fossil uh, is from there. And uh, that's all from my end. Enough talking. And I would say that now is the time for the specimens to, to shine. Thank you very much, Ricardo. That is absolutely wonderful. And um, I think it's time now to go on with our first specimen. Our first image is of a bark louse or aphid.
we're now just coming to the end of that specimen and it's time for your final challenge and this is a rather wonderful caddis fly it's ventral view so from its tummy side and we're going to be zooming in a little bit and shifting the focus down towards the head and thorax and then back again so ricardo we've had some fun Fantastic, fantastic uh, questions coming in. Um, Catherine wants to know, um, are there any diagenetic size or shape changes with these insects that, uh, that we dig out? Are there, are there any changes that you, you notice? <clears throat> yes, definitely. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I try to be as gentle as possible because I'm aware that you guys are trying to draw this beautiful caddis fly. So of course, I am aiming to be as gentle as Chris is pretty much impossible, but we'll try. So Catherine, uh, very good question. Uh, of course, both the amber and the fossils preserved inside can suffer many changes during diagenesis. Uh, for those that are not familiar with the term uh, diagenesis, uh, or we understand uh, for, uh, for dianetic processes, those that occur after the amber in this case, gets buried and therefore all the millions of years that and the, the amber spends uh, underground first of all actually amber can be sometimes reworked so sometimes the rocks that preserve the amber in the first place can uh, can be exposed and the amber because it floats as we have seen uh, in the excavation can be transported in a different place that's very far from the original one uh, so that adds a layer of complexity. But once amber is actually uh, underground and, and, and well buried, of course, the high temperature, high pressure can actually sometimes uh, completely destroy the inclusions, the fossils, and sometimes can actually overmature the amber until make it be really, really uh, dark in color and very brittle. Um, so yes, and therefore actually, finding specimens that are in good condition is relatively challenging sometimes in amber, particularly those that are uh, among the oldest. That's fantastic, Ricardo, thank you. Now, we've got a few questions about the actual amber um, itself rather than the inclusions. Now, Katharina has asked, can you tell what species of tree the amber comes from? And if yes, is there more amber from certain tree species, which, uh, which Susanna wants to know as well. She wants to know which species of tree contain the most resin. Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question, <clears throat> Katharina. So, and things that um, sometimes is no, well, usually it's very challenging to get to uh, pin down the particular species or even the type of, sorry, excuse me, or even the, the type of uh, tree that produced the resin. And um, so when that happens, so when we're actually able to narrow down the, the producer, the plant producer, uh, there are still many, many questions in, in the air. And um, I think that um, that was pretty much uh, the question, if I remember properly. That's fantastic. Now, um, we've got, uh, got some questions about um, um, the things that are caught in amber. So Eleanor wants to know what's the largest living thing that's been caught in amber? Um, and uh, Jonathan wants to know, what's the smallest thing that can be visualized in amber? Okay, so, so we have a difference here. So yeah, as like I mentioned at the beginning, um, the amber record is biased towards preserving very, very small um, creatures or their parts, right? I would say that among the largest um, um, fossils that we can find preserved in amber shouldn't be much larger than, than this. I would say uh, we do find very small frogs or small lizards, but I would be surprised to find a number inclusion that is bigger than this. It, let's take into account the fact that even something as big as this preserved in amber, I would consider this a, a, this a behemoth, something that is huge in size, right? So that's the limit for amber. And then the smallest thing that uh, can be visualized in amber. Uh, the wasp that I that I uh, showed earlier that was scanned using uh, microtomography, that specimen, it's a fairy fly. And fairy flies are about half a millimeter. So um, in, in terms of 
arthropods, I would say that's the smallest. Now we can visualize even smaller um, fossils, like uh, for instance, some nematodes. But you know, once we reach such sizes, then um, detail gets uh, quite scarce and it's very difficult to get to identify the, the fossils. Well, thank you very much, Ricardo. That's, that's brilliant. Um, now, um, Megan's asked, what's the oldest piece of preserved amber that's been discovered? So how, how far back does, you know, amber go? Sorry, Chris? How, uh, how, how far back does, does amber go? What's the, yes, what's the course, oldest yeah, piece that, uh, that, that's been discovered? Yes. So uh, the oldest amber that is known comes from the Carboniferous period which is about uh, 400 million years old. And uh, well, actually more than three, 300, something like that. Um, 300 million years uh, old. And, but it's not until the Triassic, about 210, 20 million years ago, that we find the first fossils preserved in amber. So um, of course the amber record is related to to the to the producers to the plants the trees that um uh, secreted the rest in the first place no we've got um we've got a couple of questions that directly relate to the the slides in your talk um ricardo so um laura's asked do we know how big the dionysus mask in amber was that beautiful picture that you showed us of that mask how, how big is that yes so uh and that's a picture that was taken from a, a book that does not have a scale, not in the image, nor in the caption. Uh, I tend to be quite obsessive with scales, even for uh, um, public talks, because I think it's they're fundamental, right? Now, that said, I would say that that mask shouldn't be bigger than this, perhaps. Perhaps I'm wrong, and the, and the um, original amber piece was actually larger, right? Um, now, it turns out that that particular mask uh, appears to uh, be in a private collection, but it's um, very similar to one from the British Museum. So that's all the information that I recall from the caption of the book that I showcased. That's wonderful. Thanks for thanks very much. I was wondering that myself. Um, and um, Edwin's asked, um, what it is it? What is it about the Southern Baltic region that's allowed so much amber to preserve um, there? And, and what rock types help the preservation? Yeah. So that's a really good question as well. And well, we know that for certain that forty million years ago, uh, about that time, there were massive pine tree forests in the Baltic area. And well, it turns out that um, the rocks that contain that amber nowadays are exposed, and some of those rocks are actually being exposed um, in contact with the uh, with the Baltic Sea water. Now, as we've seen from the excavation, we use flotation to extract the amber. Now, nature does that sometimes as well for us and uh, in the Baltic region actually the amber is being washed by the sea and uh, into the seashore of those southern coast of the Baltic uh, Sea and actually uh, it's, there are records of people just gathering and the amber uh, on the beach which I think it would be a very nice activity to do on Sunday. Uh, so yeah and um, um, the conditions happened for the massive resin accumulation in that area uh, in muddy or sandy sediments that are mudstones or sandstones today. And, uh, and it's also just a matter of, of finding uh, the, uh, the outcrop and that being exposed as well. Well, I think once uh, lockdown ends, that's, uh, that's actually, you know, sort of my next holiday book then. Um, now, uh, Edwin was, uh, Rachel was asking, um, it, looking at the, your slides of your, your excavation in Spain, was, was asking how many amber deposits would you expect to find per meter squared in those sorts of areas? I mean, how, how rich is it when you start digging? So it turns out that amber is a rare 
uh, material in the fossil record. But you know, once um, you start familiar with the conditions um, in which amber can outcrop, is not that exceptional. Still, it's an exceptional uh, uh, material. So um, the thing is that amber, we find amber in the field accumulated in spots. So, and we actually don't know how big an amber accumulation is until we figure out its limits. Sometimes in, it can be something that seems very big. It's actually, in the end, very small, quite limited in size. And some other times, and they are huge, right? Uh, but after doing the proper um, prospections, of course, we do all this with uh, proper permits. All the images that you've seen actually here uh, are um, qualified personnel um, gathering all that amber. And um, it's something actually that uh, we we spend a, a big deal of time and doing beforehand going to the field. So um, it's very variable how, how um, abundant amber outcrops are in the field. But in Spain, at least, those are very restricted to a very narrow area of the Iberian Peninsula. And that goes from the northern uh, uh, Iberian Peninsula to the eastern. And, and that line uh, in which um, amber outcrops from the Cretaceous, because uh, in Spain, the amber is about 100 million years old. And those are the specimens that we've mostly seen tonight. Uh, that line. Um, corresponds of outcrops in the Iberian Peninsula corresponds to the coast the, uh, during the Cretaceous in the Iberian Peninsula. So yeah, a scarce resource overall. That's wonderful. So all those things washed up on the end of a uh, the, the side of a Cretaceous coast there. Um, now that leads nicely to a couple of questions actually uh, that Katriona Kat and, and Mark have asked. Um, Katriona asks, what happens to the amber without any interesting occlusions? Do they get diverted into jewellery? And, and Mark asks, what ethical questions should you ask when you see amber for sale, both as, as jewellery and as fossils? Yes, of course, absolutely. Um, so different paths, right? Um, every country has, in the best case scenario, regulations on how to deal with, um, in this case, something that it's, um, it's in between um, paleontological heritage and jewelry, right? And that's actually one of the sources of issues in this on this front. So um, at least speaking from the case that I that I know best, which is Spanish amber, so far the amber is cannot be um, sold um, for commercial purposes because it's been is protected by by Spanish law. And, and but then of course in some other ambers that have been studied and that are known for um, for longer, those at some point in history they were made available for jewelry like Baltic amber, uh, and so and nowadays we can buy Baltic amber, and not only the ones that lacks inclusions but also the one with inclusions right. And from the scientific point of view. Um, Today, still, we're finding a very interesting findings in and discoveries in Baltic amber, right? In spite of having been studied for uh, almost two centuries or more. And of course, Mark, uh, it's, it's a key question, right? Uh, amber needs to be, of course, um, gathered with the proper um, uh, permits in a responsible way as well. And, and we need to be aware of the legislation in each of the countries and just the overall um, um, circumstances of each of the countries in which amber is uh, found. But that's, a, that's a, a vital question that we need to ask ourselves before studying any um, specimen. Also, of course, uh, those gathered from modern ecosystems. That's absolutely wonderful, Ricardo. Well, thank you so much for such a fantastic talk. Now, as people are just finishing up uh, their artworks, we're going to leave this on screen for a little bit. But uh, it's uh, it's worth a little reminder that um, if you do want to share your creations tonight, 
do post it on Twitter and tag us in at More Than A Dodo. And don't forget to check out our other events coming up. We've now finalised the programme for our Drawn to Nature series. And um, every two weeks we're going to be doing these. Um, we hope you're enjoying them. Our next Drawn to Nature event is going to be by our librarian and archivist, Danielle, who's actually going to tell you about how scientists, architects and pre-Raphaelite artists came together to build this fantastic museum. And she's going to show you some of the amazing sculptures and architectural details that are hidden around every little corner of this building. So thank you very much once again, Ricardo. And if you do want to revisit this, we will be posting it on our YouTube channel, but it's absolutely wonderful to have you all joining us tonight. And we hope that we've offered you a little bit of relaxation, inspiration and well-being from the wonderful collections we have here at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Good night. <laughs>